Let's resume recording and hello. It's week four. Yay, we made it. Um, forgive me if I sound weird or if I have to like stop talking and put myself on mute to hack up a lung. I am at that point of allergies where um, everything's being coughed back up. <laughs> because my sinuses have been draining. It went from being uh, 40 degrees on Saturday to 80 degrees on Sunday down here in Tampa because it couldn't change um, for Gasparilla. It had to still be freezing for Gasparilla. Anyway, uh, forgive me if that happens. I, you know, it is what it is, but so general housekeeping stuff, um, captions on, uh, raise your, use the hand raise feature or put your questions in the chat, that sort of stuff. You guys know that by now. One change is late work, okay? I think I mentioned this last week. But uh, the way you go about getting extra time is different this week because it is week four. If you have some, something major happen, like a medical emergency, death in the family, uh, weather issues, uh, stuff like that, please let me know as soon as possible because there is a form you can fill out and uh, basically the head of the liberal arts department will approve you making up the work, right? If it's just generally life happens and you forgot or something along those lines, then that's a different story. Um, so, you know, basically just talk to me, stay in communication this week, uh, so that we can work out any kinks as needed. What you should not do is submit something as a placeholder. Okay. Uh, I've run into this a couple times and most recently last week with a student where they just decided to um, put little asterisks around placeholder text and then not actually do the assignment. Don't do that because when I'm looking at who's done the assignment, it shows that you've done the assignment, right? And that screws everything up. Um, then you're going to be asking me for extra time on this assignment and I'm going to be like, but you did it, right? Don't do it. One, you'll probably forget <laughs> to do the assignment if you do that. I've never seen it work for a student as a method of getting work in, but you know, uh, so yeah, late work, talk to me, stay in communication. If we need to, we'll figure it out. So uh, I don't know how many of you watched the video that I uploaded. Uh, I think it was Friday. I uploaded it finally. Uh, apologies. I know I told you it would be up sooner than that. Um, if you haven't seen it, I basically walked through the 4.4 assignment. And just off the top of my head, started creating a character for this story that I'm writing to show you guys what's expected of you for 4.4. Um, and I mentioned in there that I would be talking more about it uh, this week. Uh, <coughs> and here it is. So. My method of character creation uh, can get a bit chaotic. Hi, Flannery. Can get a bit chaotic sometimes. Um, I, uh, 
I developed this character originally as a D&D &D character and then decided, <laughs> sorry, sorry guys, I've got to meet myself for a second. Um, I originally conceived her as a D&D &D character, so I made her on the app, not in any sort of uh, character worksheet like you guys have. And then I decided she was just too cool to only use for role play. So I started off with the backstory. She's got fairly normal childhood, um, becomes a librarian, library falls under attack, she ends up uh, dying and being resurrected by someone. But the someone is a big mystery, right? So that's what's driving the story, okay? And that's all I had for this character when I first decided that she needed her own story, right? So, <clears throat> Uh, one of the things that I really love about things like D&D manuals is it gives you these lovely charts. Now, I'm not saying go out and buy D&D source material, especially um, <laughs> due to uh, issues everyone has been having with Wizards of the Coast, but it it's handy if you can go to a library or a game store and just look at them because <clears throat> these are all horror tropes that help you make a character that fits into a horror story, right? So if you were building a D&D &D character, you would roll a 20-sided die and whatever it came up with, that's that's the character trait right or that's the ideal that this character has what whatever the chart is like i said i find them highly useful especially if you really don't have much of a plan yeah you just have this vague idea right of what you are aiming for right? You have a genre and you sort of have a main character. Now you need to flush things out. Okay, well, here's a good starting point. It's something like this, right? Because it's broken down the tropes for you. So for instance, it, uh, when I rolled up this character for personality trait, I got an eight and for ideal I got a six. So personality trait eight. I have a more I have morbid interest in a macabre aesthetic. Totally cool. I love that for her. Ideals. Uh misdirection. I work vigorously to keep others from realizing my flaws or misdeeds. Yes. Especially for an academic, that's great because that's basically just imposter syndrome and all academics have that. So I feel like that would fit her. And then bonds, I got a three. I owe much to a vanished mentor, seek to continue their work. That works for her, great. The problem, came when I uh, rolled for flaws and got a three. And three is I'm especially superstitious and live life of seeking to avoid bad luck and wicked spirits. Okay, well, that's an issue because she's got a lot of that going on already in the backstory. So that's going to contradict what we already have, right? You, it, it is so important <coughs> that you pay attention to issues like that. 
all right, that you make sure that you're not accidentally contradicting yourself. Now, if you watched the video uh, that I made running through 4.4 when I came up with that character, you might say, well, Shelly, you contradicted yourself in creating the character of her brother because he's this tough guy, but also rescues kittens and plays piano. Yeah, because people are like that. People are not one dimensional beings, right? It's possible for someone to put forward that exterior, but inside be a gooey person. All right. This is different. This would <laughs> more than likely, if I went with that flaw that she's superstitious, it would change the story from a horror, from a straight horror to a comedy. And that's not what I'm going for, right? I want a straight horror story. So this is where I ask you guys, what would you pick for this character? What would not contradict what we have so far? Shelly, I'm sorry. Um, can you run that back real quick? Uh, just a quick uh, overview. My wife just came from work, and I was tell telling her good hi, hi, and that's I missed about thirty seconds worth. Yeah. So uh, basically, I'm asking you guys what, uh, which one of these flaws, which one of these typical horror character tropey flaws do you think would best fit this character without it contradicting what we already have for them? So if we go back, we know she's a librarian. She really loves plants. She wants to be head librarian. She rescues stray animals. She's been resurrected from the dead. Has no idea who did it. And then she has imposter syndrome, all right? Wants to uh, keep everyone from realizing uh, that she has flaws and, you know, uh, is human. Um, she has morbid interest and in a macabre aesthetic, uh, which I really love because I don't think y'all realize how much that fits a lot of librarians. Um, and then for Bonds, she has a vanished mentor that uh, she really looks up to. So with all of that that we know, which one of these flaws do you think would not contradict that? No, uh, number three, we know contradicts her per personality as we currently have it. I go with number eight. Number eight, I need to find the best in everyone and everything, even when it means denying obvious malice. That would work, that could work. <laughs> she rescues animals um, and whatnot. So she could, yeah, I could see that. Anyone else? Thank you for your contribution, Flannery. I will take that under advisement. I really like number two, especially given uh, that she doesn't know who brought her back to life. Uh, so I'm convinced something's after me. I've done unspeakable evil. Is that what you think, Nicholas? I like that. That goes well. <clears throat> that goes well with the ideal uh, misdirection. 
So that works. Any others? I also like um, number nine. I've seen the evil of a type of place. I think she would probably say cities as opposed to a forest or a graveyard. But. But you could also argue that 10, uh, being exceptionally cautious, planning laboriously, and uh, devising countless contingencies would also play into account. But if you yeah. combine eight, you combine eight and 10, you know, it sounds about right. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And uh, number one, I believe Doom follows me. Yeah, I like that. And number 12, I know ends always justify the means and I'm quick to make sacrifices. I like it, but what uh, what led you to that, Scott? <laughs> if you can just... I like it. Does it go back to the misdirection? The same, uh, the same reason as uh, number four? Yeah. Yeah, number four and 12 work together well. Okay, cool. So like I said, um, they have these up at the at, uh, libraries. They have D&D &D manuals at um, comic book shops, game stores. They normally have some. I highly recommend just going in and finding uh, the character building charts for whatever genre or what have you um, that you wanna work in. And it helps give you just a base to start from. I've found anyway, there, um, because these are all typical horror story tropes. Right, this is from, uh, these are from one of the Ravenloft um, source books and that's the D&D &D horror stories, the horror modules. So they're all built around making sure that it fits this genre of storytelling. There's also a sci-fi one um, and the actual, uh, the actual modules really not that great to play but the character building stuff if you're trying to write a sci-fi story is good it's handy it's helpful right so look at the background charts um look at things like this and it just gives you a baseline of tropes that you're sort of expected to hit on uh, when you're writing these particular genres. Make sense? Like I said, this is just one way to go about it. This is one way that I've found um, is particularly helpful for me. Now, like I said, this just gives you an outline, a bare bones idea. You have to flesh that out and a good way to do that is to ask questions. Um, my favorite one is uh, what 10 songs would show up on the character's all-time misplayed playlist on Spotify. Even if you're writing a story that is set in a time or world or location where they wouldn't have something like Spotify, I would still find it useful as uh, a way to just sort of get the vibe of a character. What sort of character are they? If they were in our world in 2023, I had to think for a second about what year it is, what would they be listening to? Matt, what's up? Yeah, okay, I'm looking at your list. Okay, it's great. Uh, I've seen a lot of characters where Okay, the, the, even if the song is playing, um, it, it really doesn't define the character because if you go through, um, through a lot of what's going on, 
then uh, you'll notice that a lot of things contradict themselves when it comes to uh, if you're talking about the, the villain in the story, it, a lot of things contradict themselves, uh, it leaving you confused about the villain. But for the hero side of the side of things, uh, things tend to uh, have a con- have be congruent with each other, uh, playing off each other. Now, um, one of the things I wrote, if I'm looking at the last one on the list, this is kind of what kind of what made me raise my hand on this. Uh, what secrets should they keep? What are they most afraid of people finding out? I have, I've written uh, in my screenplay, there is one secret that's held till the very end that keeps popping up throughout the entire screenplay. And it's a picture. You see it, you see him holding the picture, but you never see who it is. And not only is the, the picture visible, uh, but it's only visible at the very end, and then the person shows up at the very end. And that's, cool. you know, it's kind of keeping that suspense going of, you know, what's he looking at? What's this? What, what's going on with this? And it just keeps popping up over and over and over. Um, but the music that I was uh, going along with it, uh, with this guy, is completely the opposite of what his character is. Yeah, so, and that's, that's the thing you can uh you can have music that um works in this juxtaposition um but also and thank you for mentioning this if you are writing the screenplay and you're not directing or producing it they will change your music more often than not I was told in my screenwriting class, I don't know how the screenwriting uh, teachers um, cover it here, but I remember being told to not name specific songs unless you put something like this song plays or just put a genre because that comes down to things about rights right getting uh how expensive is the song going to be um i remember i remember hearing a story about uh wayne's world um they didn't know if they were going to get the rights to bohemian rhapsody until the very end until they were ready to shoot that scene and it would have completely wrecked the scene if it had been any other song but that's something that you know if you're if you're just the guy writing it you can make song choices and you can say this is what the character would be listening to but you also have to keep in mind that at the end of the day you do not have final say in that right and also um with these questions you don't need to give the audience the answer to these questions for the most part these are for you to get a better idea of who the character is right are they impatient the second question very much would tell you how impatient they are as a person if they're constantly pressing that elevator button i would say yeah um things like what's the last book they read you don't have to tell the audience that but it's it's one of those questions where it makes you think, what kind of character is this? What would they read? Um, and why did they read it? Did they only read it because it was assigned to them somehow? That tells you about the character. The secret, you don't have to tell the audience that. Of course, you can tell the audience all of these things. That's fine. But for the most part, these are just the general sort of questions that I like to ask myself, even if I'm working in a world where they might not have something like Spotify or elevators or what have you. Uh, Maybe I make up a book right but i include like a little description of what is in the book what sort of book it is right so it's 
it's for you. It's character building kind of stuff. And there are so many questions that you can ask. I know I've um I've found character uh character sketches, character creation sheets that have like 500 questions on them. Right? It would be impossible to address all of these questions in a work but they're for you to get a better idea of who the character is right um if they show up in the book or in the story that's cool but they don't have to one thing i really love though is creating uh playlists for uh characters and world building because i i love music <laughs> and music helps get me in certain moods um so for instance uh with uh with the character i was talking about um earlier and um her brother the character that i fleshed out in the 4.4 example video i have a playlist that's just like flashback stuff or um world world building background stuff like trying to get the vibe of when she was a kid right trying to set that mood again basically putting myself back in a trailer in central florida in the 90s uh what was i listening to sort of thing what sort of music did my stepbrother introduce me to because I am sort of pulling inspiration from bits and pieces of my life and people in my life which is great awesome I'm not I'm not re, I'm not attempting to write these people right I'm just okay, I know someone like this who has XYZ trait. So I'm going to pull a little bit from them and sort of Frankenstein myself a character from original inspiration and people that I know in real life and characters that I've seen on TV and in movies and in books that I've read, right? That's one of the ways that I try to keep my work original, right? It's by peppering in those things. And like I said, Frankensteining myself a character or a situation. Yeah. I love this. If you're a music person, I highly recommend it. Um, I go overboard and create uh, playlists for different scenes and different characters to try to get into their heads or into the mood that I want for the scene. But um, especially for character creation, I highly recommend it. Um, if you're the sort of person that really connects with music, because I have found that it helps me get into that character's head and know a little bit more about them, right? So. <clears throat> Another thing, if you're stuck, if you're not sure about who your character is, what they're like, um, how they would respond in certain situations, is to put them in a situation, <laughs> right? Uh, how would they respond to a major event? that may or not may or may not happen in the story but it would give you an idea of what kind of person they are if they were trapped in an elevator what would they do what would their reaction be so they're trapped in an elevator yes and or and so if you have ever taken an improv class or an acting class you know this exercise because <laughs> i'm pulling it directly from there but 
there's a reason why this is an improv game, right? Because it's helping you build a character by putting them in some crazy situation that they may never be in in your story or someone may never be in in real life and just seeing how they respond. This is something that will probably end up getting thrown out. But again, like everything else, it helps you get into this character's mind. Okay. So any questions on that? I feel like we're speed running through this through class this week, but I've kept you guys late for every other class. So I'm not mad about it. And I'm sure you guys aren't either. But any questions on that, on any of that, any character building sort of stuff before we move on? If you're good, just give me a thumbs up or something in the chat. Or if you've got your camera on, you can. Cool, cool bands. Okay, so. The next part is the part that I really hate. <laughs> I love creating characters. I absolutely adore creating characters. If I get bored, I go on the D&D Beyond app and just make a character <laughs> that I'll probably never play and I'll probably never use, but it's fun um, for me anyway. Um, yes, I said cool beans. I'm now in my late 30s. Jeez. Um, <laughs> but so next step is the worst, which is that you actually have to write the story. <laughs> you can't just like will it into existence. I wish you could. I wish they would develop this sort of mind reading technology that would just pull the story from your brain and put it on a Word doc. Um, but you have to write it. And then once you write it, the most important thing before you start revising is to give it to someone else to read. But here is where you can run into problems, okay? If you give it to friends or family, uh, then they may not give you the most honest feedback. Or if they give you feedback, it may not be constructive criticism. And what I mean by constructive criticism is someone might tell you they liked it, but they won't tell you what they liked about it. Or they may tell you, I didn't like it, but then not tell you what they didn't like about it. Yeah, so you need someone to tell you those things. You need someone who will say, well, you didn't really explain X, Y, Z about the character to tell me why they would respond to a situation in this way. Or you didn't really do enough world building for me to understand the setting, right? And when I say world building, this goes for any genre right? You've got to establish when and where this is this story is taking place. And if you just read it yourself, you're probably going to overlook plot holes because you know the story that you're trying to tell. So your mind will just gloss over them. Yeah. So very important to give someone who is going to give you unbiased feedback and constructive criticism. Uh, one thing that I have done um, for my work, because I either write fiction that is completely out there, or I write uh, what's known as creative nonfiction essays. And it's really difficult to find people who are willing to read this and give you feedback on it compared to someone being willing to give me feedback on something like 
uh, those apples or the story that I'm plotting out now, right? Because people enjoy that kind of stuff. It's a very niche audience that enjoys creative nonfiction. So what I did is I went on Fiverr and I paid someone five bucks to read my 7,000 word essay and give me this unbiased uh, constructive criticism, right? So if you, if you feel like you have to do that because no one in your life or no one that you can find on a better reading site online, um, it's going to give you that. That's always an option. Yeah. And I found it really worked, uh, for this one piece that I sent and I sent it to two different people and got excellent feedback. All right. Then once you get that, you write a new draft based on that feedback. You don't have to use all of the feedback that you get right? Because someone may completely misunderstand what it is that you're trying to do. Uh, they mean well, but for whatever reason, it's just not clicking for them. Go back and look at that area and try to figure out why it wasn't clicking for them, but you don't have to take their feedback on it if they are misunderstanding what's being done and giving you suggestions that will completely change your story, right? Uh, and then you just repeat steps one and, or steps two and three until you've got something that you consider polished. Uh, I would recommend doing it at least twice, right? Uh, that way, once you've had a revision, you send it back out into the world again for more feedback and respond appropriately to that feedback. Yeah, because you're, it's gonna take more than one revision, nine times out of 10. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's that, right? Those are sort of the steps that you go through um, after you've created a character. Matt, yes. I have somebody with seasonal um, sinus drainage twice a year. Uh, I don't think anybody would argue if you need to pause real quick and cough one up because I can hear it building up. Um, I think that would be a bad idea uh, for my throat considering how much I shredded it right before all of this at um, a lightning game. Uh, uh -huh. I, I appreciate the thought, though. I'm just going to continue Vicks, drinking right. my Diet Coke. Try to flush it down that way. Vix and Jack Daniels would be fine. Um, so, assignments for this week. There's no discussion board this week. Instead, you are going to read a short story, um, A Day for a Daydream, and respond to the questions that are asked. And again, uh, just like in the prior weeks, please pull evidence from the text. If you're still not quite sure on how to do that, go back and look at the video that I posted in week one and take another look at that. Um, because you guys, your responses may differ. Um, you're probably not all, whoop, you're probably not all gonna agree on what the genre of this story is. I've heard so many responses. Um, I'm gonna tell you that the one genre it is not is nonfiction, right? Um, just get fiction and nonfiction out of your head as genres, uh, but it definitely is not nonfiction, right? I, we went over genres in week two, and I think for the most part, you guys understand that, but I have had that response before. So I want to save you guys from that. 
Um, Cause I really don't like taking points off of your work, even though it may seem like that to some of you sometimes. Um, so you've got that and then you've got your big assignment 4.4 where you're you are creating a character and there's a character template that you need to follow and fill out and then there are two questions after you filled out the uh, character sketch and those are uh what genre is this character in and why do they fit in that genre? And then uh, sort of give this character's story from introduction to climax. So what is the climax of a story? Because we haven't really gone over that. Um, although we've asked you <laughs> that question a couple times. What do you think is the climax of this story? Um, just so everyone's on the same page. The climax is when the character either gets or doesn't get that thing that they want, that thing that's driving the story. So for instance, uh, if a character really wants a donut, uh, this is the point in the story where they pull up to Duncan or Krispy Kreme or wherever, and then they're told that they're out of whatever type of donut it is that they want. That's the climax of the story. Everything that comes after that is your falling action and resolution, right? So the climax is the moment of highest tension in your story. Right. So we're not asking you for the entire story. We're asking you to tell us up until that moment of when they get what they want or don't get what they want. That's it. OK. So if you've taken this class before, you've done part of this assignment. It used to be 1.4. But if you're redoing the assignment, please make sure that you answer those two questions, all right? That you pay attention to the fact that there are two questions after the character sketch, okay? Does it say all the assignments are due on Thursday? It shouldn't. I'll make sure that it doesn't, that that's... Um, if it does, then that's left over from uh, December. Uh, all of the assignments are due on Sunday, uh, just like any other week. Um, I will go back and make sure that that, that it reflects that. Um, and apologies if it currently doesn't. Um, we ended the December term early because Christmas was two days after uh, that Thursday. And we didn't want Christmas to fall during the term. Uh, so that's that. Uh, any questions or concerns um, about this week and what's expected of you? Thank you for bringing that to uh, to my attention. Yeah, mine says Friday too. All my assignments say do Friday. Okay, thank you. Thank you for telling me. I'll go. Um, I'll go in and make sure to correct that. I thought I had, but I mean, <laughs> things happen. But yeah, thanks for thanks for letting me know. Everything is due on Sunday, just like any other week. Any other questions or concerns? Yeah, real quick. Um, when it comes to the 4.2, I went ahead and did it. Uh, one of the things that got me about that is it's kind of a back and forth. So for me, finding the climax of it, it it's it's not what I'm used to. It's not that big you know, ta-da moment. It's actually a really subtle 
climax uh, that's in there. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I noticed is is the climax for it is so close to the end that for the conclusion, it's like a quick down drop, and then all of a sudden it's done. Yeah, you and know. that tends to happen in short stories. Those of you who read my story for uh, weeks one and two probably noticed the same thing, where the climax hit and then it ended very quickly after that, because um, short stories don't really have the room to have a lot happen after the climax, not like a, a novel or um, or a movie or something like that. Um, and also that's just become a trend in writing. Um, but we devised these, uh, questions using, uh, what's known as a Freytag's pyramid, where if you look at the pyramid, the peak of the pyramid is the climax and you have just as much on this side, the falling action of the climax as you do in the rising right so dealing with the aftermath of the climax um but like even even a lot of fairy tales like cinderella ends very quickly after the climax the climax being when the prince finds her um and the shoe fits right um or maybe that isn't the climax maybe the climax is her getting to go to the ball and everything else that happens is the falling action i uh, if you think that something is the climax this is where using evidence from the text and being really detailed in your answer is a good thing and what we're asking for So that we can sort of see where your mind is going, why you think what you think. All right. So it's especially good for the very first question that's asking you uh, what genre it is. We really need detailed evidence from the text to back up that answer. But also something like the climax, like I just pulled Cinderella out of the top of my head. You could have two different answers for where the climax of that story is. It's either her getting to go to the ball or when the shoe fits. It depends on what you see as that character's greatest wish or greatest want, right? What is it that they want in life? What is the tension that's driving the story forward? Okay. And it doesn't have to be anything major, right? It can just be a donut. That's not world ending. It's just a want. Okay. Any other questions? If not, you guys are free to go. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and you can log off and it has been absolutely wonderful having you all in class this term. I've loved the turnout every week. This is awesome. A major change from the three or four students that I normally have every week. So thank you very much. Uh, You guys have really enjoyed having you in class. And if you have any questions on the assignments, or have any concerns, uh, please let me know, okay?